How's it going everyone? Welcome back to Boy Lie Hobby Time. About a year and a half ago, I made my first Gunpla diorama, and I really enjoyed it. I've been wanting to revisit the Gundam universe and make another diorama, but this time around, I wanted to make something quite a bit bigger. Ever since I found out about Perfect Grade Bandai kits, I've been looking for an excuse to put one together. So when one finally showed up at my local hobby store after a few years of never seeing one, I decided to take that as a sign. Once I had the box open, I have to admit I was very intimidated by the prospect of assembling 13 cubic feet of plastic. It became quite obvious that this was going to be a multiple week project. After pulling all of the plastic bags with their sprues out of the box, I quickly browsed the assembly novel and I got to work. This massive Gundam comes in multiple phases of assembly, but they do have the sprues organized in such a way that it makes it easy to keep track of the progress. To enable hard mode, you can cut out all of the pieces first, shuffle them in a box, and then begin assembly without the instructions. Even following the instructions, I did things I wasn't supposed to. I spent quite a bit of time crawling around on the floor looking for little pieces I had dropped, uh, but luckily I didn't lose anything. After the skeleton phase, I began adding muscles and it felt very nice to empty the first sprue and remove it from my workspace. I worked my way from the feet up, and I'm seriously blown away by the complexity of the articulation of this thing, which became even more impressive the further along I got in the build. I remember watching Adam Savage's video where he built this thing, and I did get a hint of the complexity from that, but experiencing the crazy amount of engineering firsthand is pretty cool. After the jetpack, arms, legs, and muscles were in place, it was time to begin adding the metallic layer that sits under the armor plates. One thing that sets this kit apart is the attention to detail in the color variation between different parts. The colors, many of them, are close enough that it would have been acceptable to use the same color, but choosing to use a slightly different color shows the intentionality behind the kit. Along with the rest of the armor came some little ruby slippers. There's no place like home. I'm surprised that actually worked. The final phase of this construction went real quick and after this bad boy was fully clothed and his beam rifle and shield had been assembled, I was able to get rid of the remaining sprues. The total build time for this bad boy was around 12 hours. Two of those were spent just applying stickers. Overall, I absolutely loved putting it together, but I might wait a while before working on another perfect grade kit. And by a while, I mean 36 hours. The next step for this guy was to figure out a display. Originally, I was planning on posing him by himself in a peaceful landscape, doing something peaceful, but my love of epic duels, of good versus evil, intercepted that idea and returned it to the other end zone. I used a gesso board, which makes for a great foundation for a diorama, and then I began piling layers of XPS foam on top. Once I had enough foam to make a 25 foot cliff in 1 to 60th scale, I began slicing it into pieces that would become a mesa. I glued all of the layers together with foam safe super glue, and then I refined the shape to accommodate some pre made resin rocks, which I glued into position along the small cliff face. After all of the rocks were in place, I did some further refining to help them blend in, and on a few sections I used my knife to give the foam a rocky texture itself. I also used a wire brush to help remove any of the hard angles and give the foam a more organic look. I repeated the process on two of the foam off cuts to create a cliff which will be the backdrop of this display. Once the backdrop had been glued in place, I cleaned up the foam scraps and the next step was to apply a terrain paste layer. For the terrain texture on this diorama, I used run-of-the-mill sculpt mold. After mixing up what looked like the suggested ratio of water and sculpt mold, I smeared it on the base. Sculpt mold gets pretty stiff and hard to work with very quickly, so mixing up and applying small batches at a time is recommended for large projects. After mixing up and applying three batches of this stuff, the base was ready for paint. Uh, but first it had to be dry, so I left it to dry. Once it was dry, and as I begin painting this thing, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons. I'd usually have coated the remaining exposed foam with Mod Podge so that I could prime with a rattle can, but I forgot, and I didn't want to wait any longer, so I primed with an acrylic primer from the airbrush. After the black base coat, I gave the landscape a misting of white or bone white I should say, directly from above to bring out the contrast and to find the highlights and the shadowy areas. 
After the Zenithal highlight had been applied, I broke out some oil washes which I mixed up off camera. I realized the big brush that I chose to paint this thing was too big for the little jars, so I transferred the paint to a tray for easier access. I really like the combination of cadmium yellow red, alizarin crimson, thallo blue, and burnt umber for my rocks. Leaning more heavily into the warmer orangish color creates a nice desert red rock look. The most important thing I've found so far with rocks and oil washes is to blend directly on the rocks and use burnt umber or another color that's more neutral and the most thinned down as the main blending color to connect the rest. After all of the colors were on, I dabbed up the excess with a paper towel and dried the rest with a hairdryer. I couldn't dry the deepest recesses, so those are still wet, but that's okay because this next step will only make contact with the edges. I used some light tan and I emptied the brush almost entirely on a paper towel, and then I dry brushed the edges of the rocks, brushing down toward the ground from above. At this point, the terrain was almost done, and that was great because I just got another package in the mail. I have to say, I really like the more subtle packaging on these older Perfect Grade kits. While this Perfect Grade Zaku may not be quite as unleashed as the Gundam that I just finished, it's still not a casual afternoon undertaking. Plus, the instructions on this one were all in Japanese, so that slowed me down a little bit as well. This kit comes with multiple elements that need to be screwed together, including this awesome little head assembly with a rotating LED eye. While this kit did take a while to build, it went faster than the other one for one main reason. It didn't have two additional shiny layers underneath the armor. Once the skeleton was done, you slapped on the final layer, and it was good to go. It also came with ten fully articulated fingers, which is pretty cool. Once all of the individual body parts had been completed with their armor on, I built the weapons and I did the final assembly of the Zaku. When I was done with the kit, there was one piece left and I wasn't sure where it was supposed to go. It's just a single standalone bullet. There were specific instructions about it in Japanese, and when I translated it, it said I could display it wherever I liked. Luckily, I have this little baseball display case and no baseball, so it'll go in there. With both of the mobile suits done, it was time to get them ready for some combat. I gave the Zaku a more aggressive pose, and then I figured out his placement on the base. He obviously won't stay put without some help, so I will need to drill some holes into his feet. I drilled holes in the base first, and then I ran some brass rods all the way through, which I cut to length using a small pipe cutter. Once the brass rods were in place, I ruined the resale value of the Zaku. I'm sure some of my viewers won't be ecstatic about that decision, but this is my Zaku and I'd rather have him stay in place and look cool than have perfect feet. The next modification that I made was to the Heat Hawk. I removed a bit of plastic from this edge so that I could fit a flexible filament inside with the excess of the filament hidden in the handle. I wasn't sure if that was going to work, but after the filament and wires were in place, everything fit snug. I then glued the clear acrylic blade in place and I'm honestly super happy with how it looks. I did go back and sand the edge to help diffuse the light a little bit better. I then ran the wires from the axe down behind the armor plates, which is very easy and convenient at this scale, and once the wires were all inside the torso, I trimmed them down and connected them to the wires coming from the head. Off camera, I assembled the blast from the beam rifle and connected it to the other wires inside the chest. Next, I moved back to the base, and I installed my power supply and a reed switch under the low flat section of terrain. I also traced and cut out some acrylic sides which will be painted black off camera. To activate the switch that is underneath the base, I'm going to use a plaster rock. I gently drilled a small hole and then I glued a magnet inside. I then painted the rock to blend in with the rest of the terrain using some oil washes and some dry brushing and then it was time to move back to the base and wrap up the wiring. Once all of the wires coming down from the Zaku had been connected to the switch and then to the batteries, I carefully put the Zaku in place. The beam from the rifle is supposed to be magenta, but I did not have a magenta filament on hand. I will swap this out eventually. I'm gonna change the color in post so that you guys will see what it will look like when it's done. The suits were a little too clean and looked right off the assembly line, so I gave them some panel lining and weathering with the airbrush. I removed the masking tape from the heat hawk and I used some UV resin to give the beam a little more volume right where it leaves the barrel. The last thing to do was to put those nice clean black sides in place and I called it good.
here's a shot of me standing behind the diorama so you can get a sense of the scale and just how big these Gundam kits are. I had a lot of fun with this build. Also, I'm going to be selling some little wooden pins of my Peppermint Angelfish logo. I'll be taking pre-orders for those. The link will be in the description. That is it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Huge shout out as always to my patrons. You guys are the best. Have an awesome week everyone. I'll see you next time.